In this lecture, we're going to talk about how the IT organization is managed. How do we manage the people and the resources available in an overall organization's IT department or division? Um, and how uh, I'll talk specifically also a little bit about outsourcing, although some of that discussion will hold off uh, into our cases. So in today's uh, online lecture, we're going to get some of the concepts, and then uh, in the the later class, we'll be uh, we'll be having our discussion of the three cases. So please read those cases carefully. I'll be assessing participation. Uh, so that's what's coming up next. Uh, also, uh, in addition to reading the cases for the next class, please be aware of the web design project, uh, which is uh, which is due very soon, and also the video project, which is the last thing of the semester. Make sure you've got uh, those on track. All right, so back to the management of MIS. At a very fundamental level, the main thing that an IT organization needs to focus on is that it needs to support the overall organization's business strategy. Oftentimes when IT uh, strategy uh, and the business strategy are misaligned or not aligned, uh, that that's when the IT is viewed poorly because it's not doing what it's supposed to. It's not helping the business to reach its uh, its goals. And that it, it actually it sounds like a really simple idea, but it actually is a really common thing for the IT organization and the overall business to be a little bit out of alignment. Sometimes this is because of you know lack of leadership, whether it's at the corporate level or within the IT organization. Sometimes it's that you know, in IT, there's some things that are really cool and interesting. Uh, for example, I was talking with uh, a former executive of Walmart uh, not too long ago, and I was talking about how it's really interesting that some of the executives there really wanted to push to compete with higher-end brands and that the IT wanted to support, in some cases, uh, a movement towards, search, you know, selling towards luxury items and, and more higher-end items. But Walmart's overall corporate and business strategy is the low-cost uh, provider, and so those don't really match up entirely. And so we've got to be careful that, that the IT organization, if you're in a company that focuses on low-cost, well, you maybe want to work on low-cost in the IT organization as well, and so forth. Now, in an IT organization, uh, almost always nowadays, the, the main IT person uh, who's over all the IT organization is called the Chief Information Officer. Now this isn't entirely consistent, uh, just like in some some organizations there's a CEO and some there's a president and some there's both and uh, so sometimes it's a little mess, uh, mixed, but the, the Vice President of IT, uh, the person who's in charge of the IT organization is most commonly called the CIO, the Chief Information Officer. And the things we've talked about already, but they're, they're in charge of a lot of things, okay? Include the, the strategy, the strategic planning of the IT organization, how it fits also with the overall organization's uh, strategy. Outsourcing, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Process improvement, including business process re-engineering. We've already talked about that a bit this semester. E-business and e-commerce, we've talked about that this semester. Uh, information security, that's coming up very soon in a, in a later lecture, and so we'll talk about that soon the infrastructure of an organization and that includes things like the network and some of and the hardware and many of the servers and the software the the sort of core technologies that run behind the scenes i like to define infrastructure in some of my classes as as there's technical definitions but i like to define infrastructure as what hap or the part of the organization that if it stops working people complain and if it's working, nobody notices it. And so things like, did the phones work? Does the internet connection work? Is the servers up? All of those things people take for granted until they go down and then it's a huge deal. Uh, legal issues, regulatory issues, compliance issues are all also often uh, within the domain of the CIO. Uh, in many organizations, there's a separate um, person who's in charge of those in, in certain types of organizations. For example, in pharmaceutical, there's usually compliance officers and regulatory officers. but because technology affects everything and there are quite a few laws around privacy and things, uh, the CIO is heavily involved in compliance. And the last part is, is finances. Um, in some organizations, the CIO reports to the, uh, to the chief financial officer, that's a, that's a common reporting relationship, and the organization's finances uh, are, are an important thing. Now one thing I'll say first is it, it often says quite a bit about the organization and how they value IT on who the CIO reports to. 
if the CIO is a direct uh, has a direct report reporting relationship with the CEO, oftentimes that that's a signal that that technology is uh, is viewed as as a strategic um, uh, asset in the organization. Oftentimes, if the CIO reports directly to the CFO, that often means uh, that the IT is viewed as a cost center and it kind of uh, shows what type of organization and how the IT organization will be treated. It's not entirely um, 100% that, but uh, you know, if, you, if you're going into IT, uh, you, might, you might look at see where your IT uh, organization's head, usually the CIO, is reporting. All right, so what is, what is the various things that the CIO manages? Well, we talked about many of those different topics and concepts, but another way of thinking about it is that when you lead the IS function, um, the IT function and organization, there's really three things that you're managing. And we often forget about uh, one of them or sometimes even multiple. Um, so number one, the technology assets. We've covered that quite a bit this semester. You know, this is the overall hardware, software, infrastructure, um, you know, systems that, that we typically are talking about. The bottom one is also fairly obvious, the, the human assets. Uh, we need IT talent in order to make uh, the, I, the IS function work. And managing IT folks uh, sometimes is viewed as quite a bit different than managing some of the other functional groups. Uh, IT workers, uh, in some cases, are, are just different. Um, and in, in another class, you know, we, you know, some of our other MIS classes, we would go into this in more detail, and I'd have you read a few articles about this. Uh, but it's really, it's really interesting, IT people, sometimes are just a bit different in how they are, are, are work and, and manage an organization. But the middle one I want to talk about is relationship assets. And this is the part that we often forget about, is when we're working with other organizations through collaboration efforts, and we've talked about collaboration this semester, it's hard to do collaboration. We're gonna have a whole case on this um, in our next class that we'll discuss, the, uh, the Schaefer case. One thing that's interesting about the Schaefer case is when we, uh, when we went in, I, I, was, I was a co-author of that case, uh, so we went into the organization that the Schaefer case is based off of. One thing that the key things that they had found out is that managing an outsourcing relationship with another organization and managing that contract, that relationship, is really hard. You think you just go and sign a contract and then the other company goes and does some of the work that you were previously doing and you takes that a load off of you. But as it turns out, managing those relationships, whether it's collaboration relationships, whether it's contractual relationships, these are challenging. And the IT organization uh, is successful when it co you know, correctly and, and fruitfully manages these relationships. Now, when we manage these technology assets, so if we're talking about the hardware, software, infrastructure, when we manage those, we're really focused on a couple of different things. Managing and delivering on services and managing applications. I'm not going to go into that in too much detail, um, but you know these are kind of the big concepts of what we what we're trying to to deliver. Whether we're providing actual a software application or whether it's some sort of service. You know, for example, you know on this campus, you know we we have services like you know internet con connectivity. Um, you know, and so if the internet's down, that's a problem. But also if you can't access the registration system, that application, that's a problem. Now. Why is IT and IS organizations so interesting and also so challenging? Well, number one is, as you know, technology changes extremely rapidly. Everything just goes, I mean, there's new technologies, there's new ways of using and applying technologies all the time. And that severely impacts uh, IT organizations. Do we search after and go after the next greatest thing? Are we all becoming, uh, going into analytics, which is a very hot topic right now, or not? How do we you know, respond to these sort of things, especially when our competitors start pursuing these technologies? How do we even keep up with the ideas here when new things come out? Another problem we've talked about with databases and, and also with analytics is that data is becoming big. How do, we, how do we deal with the fact that everything has its own app? And how do we make those apps talk to each other when we, even when we decide to adopt an app? What do we do about this mounds and mounds and mounds of data that we've started collecting because it's a good idea and everyone else is doing it? What do we now do with it? How do we analyze it? There's a, there's a big um, push now that IT folks used to be really focused on the very technical parts of doing things. And they're still, they're still important, absolutely. 
But what's interesting is the CIOs, often it's hard to find a very good CIO that understands both the technical aspects, but actually legitimately understands management and the business functions. Finding that mix is actually really hard to do. A lot of the, the startup areas, uh, in, you know, even, even the ones that are doing well in this country, um, they often have a hard time getting big, like really big, um, because they don't have the person who can be the technologist and lead the company and the business person. Uh, and so that's a really important role. And then in addition to that, we also experience you know, within IIS uh, really frequent, what, what I'm calling here external shocks. Things change, and and you know w- whether it's the economy you know going down, whether it's dot com bubbles, uh, whether it's big security breaches, but there's all sorts of changes external to the organization that have dramatic impacts on how the IT organization works. The IT organization is often the organization that's budget gets cut um, when things are bad, um, but that is expected to do even more when when things are good and uh, and external changes um, external shocks often um, you know really impact the IT organization all right we could spend a long time talking about governance I'm going to talk a very brief bit about governance Uh, so governance is a larger topic uh, that has to do with how we structure and how we manage and how we organize um, an organization in this case the IS organization Um, I'm going to talk about kind of just the the overall where do we put certain things so uh, you know, this slide talks about a classic sort of centralized and decentralized uh, governance structures. Let's kind of walk through what that what those mean. So we have kind of our three options here. We have a centralized, a decentralized, and then there's sort of this overlap where, where we kind of have a hybrid approach. This is becoming more common lately. So a centralized governance design, this is what this means. We take our IT operations and our applications from all of our different business units, whether this is different divisions, whether this is our subsidiaries, whether this is our, uh, you know, our operations in various countries, however we decide to organize ourselves as a company. But we centralize all of our operations, meaning our, our data centers, um, you know, our, our network infrastructure, our, our overall IT infrastructure, all of the operational side, and we centralize the applications. Well, why would we want to do that? Well, in some cases, um, we can gain economies of scale, especially if we're a large organization. Why should we run in each business unit? Why should we have its own data center when we can centrally manage things? And we might be able to get rid of some of the, uh, the you know, some redundancy, manage it with potentially fewer overall people, and gain those cost efficiencies. The other benefit of centralization is that we can integrate things far better if everything's centralized. If we can all manage one thing, one you know suite of applications and operations all in one place then we can make them work well together and then something that's not in the slide is you know it's sort of the, the concept of backup and redundancy is well you know it's challenging to put things all in one place we've talked about this a little bit before this semester um, but what happens if uh, if we can then make our backup solutions and our disaster recovery much better because we have a centralized um, you know, source of IT operations that then we can, you know, properly um, and effectively, you know, do the the backups and the and the, the recoveries on. The challenge with that, though, is the advantage of our next uh, governance structure. So a decentralized governance structure means that we don't centralize any of our operations uh, at corporate level, uh, but within each of our business units, we let them manage their own operations and their own applications individually. So we don't get the economies of scale. It often is more costly. But what happens if your business units are quite a bit different from each other? We're going to see that again in the in the Schaefer case uh, that we're going to discuss next class. What happens if your different business units are, are very different from each other? What if we're a company like General Electric, which divisions do things from making CAT scan machines to making airplane engines and turbines for electric dams and consumer electronics and all sorts of things? Well, those business units might be quite a bit different from each other. And so it makes sense to have their applications more customized to the specific unit. And so customization can lead to better uh, effectiveness for that, whereas a one-size-fits-all solution might not be ideal for all of the business units. 
So these sort of governance structures are very commonly found where the business units are quite disparate and somewhat autonomous. They run, run themselves. Now, hybrid is becoming more and more common because centralization and decentralization have, have pros and cons, and we want to try to minimize those cons. So there's a type of hybrid solution called federal. We'll see that next. Um, and then everything that's not really federal but is still hybrid, we'll just call customized. It doesn't really have any particular name, but we'll call it customized. So here's, here's what a federal uh, governance structure looks like. We centralize the operations, the data centers, the infrastructure part of the organization, and capture those economies of scale. But then at each business unit, we let them manage their own IT applications. Even if they're hosted centrally, we let them manage their own IT applications. That allows for the customization necessary for some of the business units, but also captures some of the overall economies of scale and efficiency of having things centralized. It's a nice structure. Uh, it's very commonly used today. And then a customized design is sort of everything else that doesn't really fall into federal, but has some sort of centralization and some decentralization. So we might have, for example, uh, I don't this top business unit where you have the you know operations and applications are all centralized. Uh, some of the things are IT operations are centralized, but some are not. And you know, we have just sort of this miscellaneous category. Now, which one of these is best? Well, many organizations, like I said, are, are moving towards a more federal design, but that doesn't necessarily mean it makes sense for all organizations. Uh, a, a centralized approach or a decentralized approach might make a lot of sense. Now, if you were to think about, uh, you know, a, a university campus, what type of governance structure do we think is used at a university campus? You pause the video and think about that for a second. What does is, what is Sac State use for its governance structure? Well, hopefully you've thought about that. As it turns out, it differs quite a bit from university to university. Uh, Sac State tends to have an extremely centralized governance structure, Okay, very, very centralized. Uh, whereas some other organizations, uh, Harvard, for example, uh, Harvard has a very, very decentralized governance structure where each college tends to operate almost completely independently from each other. So it just depends on the organization. Next, I want to talk about uh, a structure that is, is, is related to the governance structures uh, called a shared services model. And this one's really interesting. So we might have a, a very large organization, multi-divisional or you know, multinational organization. What the company might choose to do is they may choose to set up the IT operations in the organization and the applications uh, and have it act as if it were its own independent entity. Meaning that it has to bid and sell products, services, applications uh, to the rest of the company. And when a business division, part of the company, needs to go and you know get IT services, they have the option of going to this shared service organization within the company, or they have the option of going outside the company, or in a very large corporation, perhaps to multiple shared service organizations within the company. Now, why is this good? Well, many organizations have found that having IT actually have to compete and act as an independent entity often makes it much more efficient. Um, it doesn't. It reduces a lot of the waste that sometimes happens in, in organizations that don't have to compete outside of the company or within other shared with other shared service organizations. And so, in a large enough organization, it's kind of an interesting model uh, that you see pop up from time to time. Now, when we manage service delivery, and we talked about that, uh, we have trade-offs that have to be made. And you know, I, I hopefully I've emphasized this semester that you know, when when we make certain decisions, oftentimes the answers aren't completely right or wrong, black or white. The answers are well, it it kind of depends. You know, for example, in this list, do we want security? Well, of course we do. How much security do we want? Well, that might become a, a balancing act between highly, highly secure or really, really expensive, okay? Because good security costs money. Additionally, good security also makes it a huge pain in the butt for your users, right? Because the more security rules and policies and technologies that are in place, the more 
difficult it is to access information. And it becomes sort of this trade-off between convenience versus having good security. How much security is enough? Well, there are ways, we're not going to go into it in this class, but there are ways of sort of quantifying that and trying to figure out how much security do you need, you know? Another thing is, what about, what about bandwidth or server response time? Of course, nobody wants a super slow, super laggy response time uh, to their server, to their important applications. But does it make sense to invest in the best of the best? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on your organization. Similarly, what about uh, software and also services? Do we go with what's very standard, what's very uh, common uh, across the organization, whether this is a system, whether this is a piece of hardware, whether this is a piece of software, or do we go with something that is completely proprietary to us that might give us certain advantages, but may not integrate it very well and may not be as easy to support? And so we have, we have these trade-offs that we have to manage in an IT organization. All right, let's talk about chargeback systems. These are not at all exciting systems, uh, but they're important systems. So uh, a chargeback system is the idea of where we apply cost accounting to our IT organization and put some systems in place in order to help out with that. So one thing that's really common in, in organizations is to view uh, IT as a cost center and to wonder why are we spending so much of our budget 30%, 40%, 50% of our budget, depending on the organization, um, of our budget on chargeback systems. I'm not on chargeback systems, on IT. Why does it cost so much? Well, chargeback systems help to quantify that. Okay, So we might have charges, for example, uh, how much time a particular uh, IT professional spends on certain things. Uh, how much CPU or computer usage is used on a server, how many computers are used, uh, how much sp file space is used on a network, how many transactions are processed by a mainframe, uh, how much memory is needed for a particular application on the server, how many users use an application. And so chargeback systems take things that are quantifiable like these and log them, track them, and then use them to give pass on those costs to each business unit. Now, why is this good? Well, it assigns costs um, to those who benefit from the IT. It looks like I have a typo on there. Um, and it allows us to um, identify, oftentimes organizations will say, oh yeah, I want, I want IT services, I want IT services, until they're asked to pay for it, then they go, eh, maybe that's not that important. And so it can get rid of the less efficient, less effective, and more wasteful IT services, uh, because you can see the cost directly from them. And from an IT person's perspective, it also overcomes the, the perception that IT costs are really, really high and that they're wasteful, um, because people can then see, oh, no, this is exactly what I'm paying for, it just costs that much. I've kind of already talked about this uh, because of uh, identifying the costs. It provides some incentives for uh, for reducing those costs. Um, it helps IT to move from a very budget-oriented uh, approach, which tends to be really inefficient. Why why would we even have any concept that our budget in the next year has anything to do with the previous year if the whole organization has changed and our business environment has changed? Maybe it's useful for something that's more stable, but IT tends to be much less stable. And so the, uh, you know, this chargeback systems help the organization to be more business driven um, and you know, helps IT you know, meet their goals and to serve the organization better. And then we've already kind of talked about this and ma other managers outside of IT tend to understand uh, IT a little bit more because they know what exactly they're paying for. All right. So if you have a good chargeback system, uh, it should be easy to understand. Uh, it should provide prompt and regular feedback, meaning if you, you know, ask for a certain service, the chargeback system should give you feedback that you know that service has been provided and how much it costs. Um, you know, it has to be controllable and accountable. The things that uh, that our accountants are, are all concerned about. The charges should be re relative to some benefit. I mean, you shouldn't just get charged for something and it doesn't provide some business benefit to the organization. So if it's a good chargeback system, you should understand that it's helping you. And then, of course, it needs to, to help the organization be aligned uh, with, with the business and the, the IS goals. Service level agreements. This is a different topic. Service level agreements, or SLAs, 
have to do with the contractual agreement uh, to provide a particular service level um, for whatever it happens to be. We're going to talk quite a bit about this during our, uh, our Schaefer case because this is an important consideration. So I'm going to just barely touch on it now and kind of wait uh, until later. But the idea is that you know, let's say that you're uh, if you're paying Amazon money for its cloud services, and you're you know you're paying for uptime uptime of above ninety nine percent. And what happens if all of a sudden the internet goes down? Like uh, at the time of recording this video, it did a, a couple of weeks back. Um, what happens then? Well, as it turns out, Amazon's you know if you can prove that your organization was affected by the uh, by the outage, then you get a free month of service. That's in their service level agreement. And so we often have service level agreements for any outsourcing and contractual relationship. All right, outsourcing. Outsourcing is a really controversial topic. Um, it shouldn't be, uh, but it often is, especially uh, what, what's sometimes called offshoring or outsourcing to a, a different country, even if it's a sometimes called nearshoring a, uh, a company or country that's near to you. But outsourcing can be effective and it can also be exceptionally ineffective. Uh, it can often provide cost savings. Uh, this can happen because of, you know, things like, uh, you know, arbitrage situations where it's just less expensive in other countries uh, for certain types of services. But also because, you know, some organizations just aren't good at certain things, IT related and otherwise, and it makes sense to outsource those. I, outsourcing also can be very, very complex. Even simple outsourcing rela relationships or seemingly simple ones often have very complex service level agreements and these, these things take months and months and months of preparation uh, prior to the negotiation just to even prepare for. Um, you know, as we'll see in the Schaefer case, they were concerned about their the renewal of their contract and they were preparing two years out just to get ready for contract negotiations. Now, oftentimes outsourcing consists of long-term contracts. It doesn't always, uh, but oftentimes that that's challenging, right? So if you make a you know five-year contract, well, what happens if your organization changes at year two? Uh, and that's going to be a challenge. Now, after you outsource services, oftentimes it's very difficult to bring them back in-house if you were to choose to do so. Uh, and that, you know, sometimes is a, is a downside of outsourcing. Especially if, what if the outsourcing arrangement is not working? And that's actually been kind of a a trend recently. There was a big push towards outsourcing, especially to certain countries that were that were inexpensive. You know, for a while there it was India and, and some of the countries around there, and then you know recently it's been to other companies, Brazil, Argentina, Russia, and some of the former Russian states and and others. What happens if those providers, whichever they happen to be, are not are not actually meeting the needs of the organization? How do we bring things back in? There's been a movement towards bringing things back in uh, because of the, the challenges of collaboration. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is legacy systems. Legacy systems means all of those old systems that are kind of around because of a, well, if it's not broken, we're not going to fix it or replace it kind of mentality. The problem with these systems is even if they don't break, we still have to keep them up and running and we still have to make sure that they're all, you know, chugging along, that the data is coming in properly and, and, and moving around properly. And over time, these systems tend to cost more and more and more. Even if they're not broken, they tend to cost more. Uh, and as a percentage of the IT budget, this can start creeping up to, you know, more than 50%, more than, in this case, sometimes more than 80% of an IT budget uh, are made up with these old systems that, yes, they're still technically working, but they cost so much money and it would be great to move to a new system, but all of a sudden, now you don't have enough budget to move to a new system because your budget's consumed with these old legacy systems. And when you try to take new technologies and integrate them with old legacy systems that weren't designed to work with other systems, oftentimes this can be very, very challenging. So legacy systems, are, they aren't necessarily bad, but they often can kind of be a, a little bit of an anchor on an IT organization and you know, keeping it in the past and not allowing it to work uh, towards the future. 
All right, so our next class, as I mentioned, we're going to be discussing cases, three different cases. Please read all three of them uh, and come prepared to discuss them. I will be assessing participation. Also upcoming after that is we have our online class on security, and then we'll, uh, after, after that we'll have a, a little bit of in-class time where we'll discuss a little more on security and then talk more about innovation after that. So please do the readings for the, for the online class and then the, the homework questions that are, um, that are due, oh, they're not due at the start of class, uh, the pre-class readings are due at start of class, but then there's the in-class uh, readings also on top hat. So please uh, take care of those. Mm -hmm.